the first thing I want to mention, of course, you're going to be one of the four new national hosts. Yes. How excited is that for you? I'm excited. There's a lot of trepidation, too, which I think is normal and healthy. Uh, it's a big change. It's a big change for me, personally. It's a big change for Canadians that they may not even understand yet. But it's, it's, it's good. It's good to be part of something that's new that we can sort of create and mold and have a big say in. That's fun. Now, I've seen the press release mm -hmm. of what the new national is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know a little bit more detail because, you know, we're used to seeing Mansbridge or yeah. Wendy and yeah. it's the one host. Yeah. If it's like Peter's away at night, you get Wendy. Yeah. Um, so with four and then all different locations, mm -hmm. how is it going to work? So without giving everything away, first of all, there will there's four, so there's four different hosts, four, three different locations. There will be a fewer stories actually on the show. We are we are going from the assumption that by ten o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock at night, people know what has happened during the day. We are, we cannot come on and pretend that there's been a hurricane. We, like everybody knows, it's too late now. So the idea is to take a story whether it be the hurricane or something else, and dig into it in a different way. Bring more context, bring in more analysis, bring some in-depth stuff, ask some questions and answer them that maybe you haven't asked through the day. So there's that part of it. And then there will be, you know, hosts will have different segments. I will have at issue, which I'm very happy about on Thursday still. And we will really just try and put the focus on stories you don't know, uh, original stories, new ways of telling stories. And I think the four person thing, because a lot of people don't understand, we're not rotating days. We are all on every day unless someone is out working on a story because the idea is that we are also journalists. So we're going to go out and do things. Or if there's events, we'll go out and cover things like the Las Vegas shooting. One or two of us would have gone for that. And because we're in different time zones, particularly Andrew, it means that the show can be hot. Lots of people don't realize this, but the national, <laughs> when it was taped, after it was done, sometimes at 10, sometimes at 11, Peter got went to go home, right? And then that's the show that you saw on the West Coast. And that was fine, unless it wasn't, unless something happened. So we will, the three of us, they're in the Eastern Times, and we'll be there until 11. And then Andrew will still be there until 2 Eastern, which is 11 Pacific. And so if things are happening in the world, he will be able to update and refresh the show or throw things out and rebuild things as needed. So I think it it is a better it will be better just in terms of being able to represent the country and what's happening across the country better for all time zones. Okay. That Does makes, that give you an yeah, idea? That gives okay. A lot more detail. Okay, good. Good. Um, I just had to explain it to some people in the newsroom, so <laughs> No, it's very in depth, so that was good. Good. So let's go back to the beginning, uh, back home in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. That's where you kind of got your start. You graduated from, and I'm going to butcher this because I'm a okay. Newfoundlander, oh, oh. Uh, University de St. Bonfance. Bonifaz. There you go. See, yeah. in my mind, Bonfance means happy face. No, that would be bun fast. Bunny fast. It's bunny fast. <laughs> sort of, I guess, yes. You, and then, of course, you went to Carleton to do your master's mm -hmm. in journalism. So that's alumni right there. Very good. You returned home to be a researcher for CBC's French station, RDI. How did that all come about? So that actually I did at the same time as I was doing my BA, which was in French literature. And I had a poli-sci prof at uh, Collège Universal de Saint-Boniface is actually an affiliate of the University of Manitoba. It's the Francophone College. And he just knew that there was this opening for a researcher and suggested my name. They asked me and I somehow balanced that job with school. And so that was my first foray into journalism and into TV. And I would, uh, French is my second language, but I would uh, research and chase guests. I would write green and I would roll the teleprompter, which I'm very proud of because I think that, you know, journalism is one of those jobs where you have to like go through the ranks and you really can't get more bottom of the barrel than ro rolling the teleprompter. So I've, I, I've, I've done all those things. I've done the teleprompter. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting in a sense. It's quite of, stressful. Too. Yeah. Quite stressful. Like, you're a rookie yeah. and then they're tossing you in there with like one yeah. of their big hosts and yeah. sometimes and you hear, could screw it up. Yeah. yeah. And you'll hear yeah. them in the mic go like, Tell him to slow it down. Yeah. And you're like, I have a name. Yes. I, yes. <laughs> tell me how you got interested in journalism. I don't really know. You know, it just, uh, I, I got that taste of it. And I liked, uh, I immediately liked TV. I liked the immediacy of it. I liked the power of it, how you can bring people to places. And it just started to make sense with some of the other things that I like to do. Talking, writing, communicating. And so I applied to, um, to Carlton. I got in. Yeah. yeah, that's a tough program to get into. 
Is it? The, ma- the is master it? of dragons. Yes. I don't know. Okay, good. <laughs> That's what I've been told. Oh, okay, good. Let's go with that. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, you worked with Global as a National yes. Assembly of Quebec correspondent, mm-hmm. a role you took at CBC yep. until you became like a parliament. Mm-hmm. What kind of got you into politics? Because out of all those four hosts, I look at you as being the most political savvy. And now, it's nothing against the other three. No. Because I don't want them no. to phone tomorrow and be like, listen, no. we're not doing your interview now. I think they would agree that I'm the person that loves it the most, that is yeah. the nerdiest about it. I honestly was not that into politics. I, I know lots of people are think that's very surprising. I mean, I took poli-sci classes. So, you know, I knew some basics. But then when I moved to Quebec, I was initially a general reporter in Quebec, and then I became the National Assembly reporter. And it was at a time where separatism was still thriving, might be too strong a word, but still present. Jean Charest had just come back to Quebec to save the Quebec Liberals. There was the rise of a new party led by Mario Dumont. So there was a lot going on. And Quebecers have a very intense feeling about politics. They're very passionate about it because there is often so much at stake for them. And somehow that sort of got transferred to me, that passion. And I learned a lot uh, from some pretty formidable politicians and and French reporters while I was there. And I just really haven't looked back. There's lots of things that I like about it. Uh, I, I really like trying to understand motivation and tactics, you know, why people are doing something, if they're laying traps for people to fall into politically. But I also, uh, as I've grown and, and the more time I've spent here, really appreciate important conversations about public policy. And that might sound boring, but I like trying to understand what governments are trying to do to help people and why they're trying to do it and and then trying to identify gaps or holes that they need to fix and and people that they need to help more and i think you see that in your own show and like because in 2015 you took over power politics now i want to give you credit because there's a lot of journalists out there that say when you took over they they liked your style of it's i like to call a pit bull kind of style Mm. of more or less like you don't take someone's shit Mm -hmm. you just basically you're going to call someone out on their phoniness in case of the immigration minister, mm-hmm. I believe uh, you told him that he was dodging the question. Yeah. Do you ever worry when you do that that the guests won't return or that other guests will not come back? Well, I think I mean I think there's a, there's a few things you have to always be respectful to someone, particularly politicians who are you know they believe in what they're doing, they're committed to what they're doing, they represent people. So I, I'm always respectful of them and and their positions, but I don't, as you say, like taking shit, uh, and I particularly don't be like being lied to. So, and and I and the reason I don't like that is is not because of me. It's because my job is to provide answers and information for people. And if I know that they're not telling me the truth or they're not answering a question, then I have to do my job and say, well, you're not doing this and you're not answering that or that's not true. And and I have to do that because otherwise. Otherwise, what are people getting out of it, right? That's my job is to get information, correct information, and call people on it when they're not. Now, I have had people who have been upset after interviews, but the vast majority of them have not been. Most people seem to think that I am relatively fair. If I'm not, they call me and tell me. We hash it out. But most politicians understand the nature, the dynamic. And I would point out that in the case of the interview you're talking about, Chris Alexander actually showed up the next day for another interview and did the interview that he probably should have done the first day. So I personally think that politicians do best when they are not lying or, or trying to avoid telling the truth. There there are ways to frame answers to make it sound better, for sure, yeah. but lying usually doesn't ever work. It, it seems like it's a tough spot to be in as a journalist because you kind of want to make sure like the guest, you, you get along with the guest, but at the same point as your job as a journalist is to get the facts. And when someone's not giving you that and mm-hmm. you kind of know it, you're kind of like, do I step over the boundary and say, no, that's not right, and like kind of make the person look kind of foolish mm-hmm. and jeopardize a relationship there? Mm-hmm. Or do you kind of lay back and then have people come after you and say, well, now you're on their side? Yeah, well, I would never uh, be worried about making someone look foolish because I actually don't think I'm making them look foolish. Like, they make yeah, themselves yeah. look foolish, right, by not knowing what they're talking about or not telling the truth or not being honest. I actually think it looks worse 
if I sit back and don't say anything. Because I know that at home, my mom is saying, why did she let him get away with that? Or why did so-and-so say... Like, that That to me is, is, is what people expect of me. They don't expect me just to say, oh, okay, yeah, you've said that to me 16 times now and not given me an answer? No problem. Yeah. Like, they expect me to be, be, to be tough. And there's lots of politicians wh- whom I have been very tough on, and they still, um, you know, get along with me and we have a cordial relationship. We are not supposed to be friends. No. Uh, we are supposed, nor are we supposed to be enemies. We are supposed to have a working relationship. And I think most people who I've interviewed understand that. And, and, that, yeah. and that's what you want them to Like, I think everyone kind of knows where their platform is. And that's knows, right. like What their job is. Yeah, yeah. Like she's yeah, a journalist. Sure. She's yeah. going to come after me or like yeah. at certain points if she thinks that's I'm right. not being honest. But like once the interview's done, it's not, if you kind of get along with them, yeah, it's great, but it's not to a point where they're like, no, that was terrible. I'm not doing that anymore. Well, I think the, I think the only time that someone could be legitimately angry with you is if you really disrespected them yeah. and treated them badly. But if you were doing your job respectfully and always keeping the audience in mind, I don't think anyone can come to you after and, and say that. You've interviewed some big names. We had uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, Trump's kind of chief of staff now as well, John Kerry. Mm-hmm. Is, is there one that really stands out for you? People always ask me that question, and I never have a very good answer, I'm afraid. Um, you know, every, it's always good to do interviews with big, important people, because you get to ask them questions and, and try and understand their way of thinking. You know, I like interviewing people trying to make a difference, or people who are promoting a particular policy, or whatever, all sorts of things. So, yeah, there's no one interview that I've done in my life, and I thought, wow, that was amazing. You know, there's some cool moments, but yeah. In, in doing all the, the interview process, do you, do you ever go in, like, when you see who you got on your guest list, do you go, do you ever get nervous? Has that ever come to mind? Like, even when you're doing shows now, like, even your last show, do you ever kind of get nervous of thinking, like, this is it? Like, this is my last show? My last show, I was, uh, I don't know if nervous is the right word. I was very emotional. I was very sad because it's a job that I really loved and didn't really want to leave it. But how do you? turn down the other job so yeah, that day I was just hoping I could hold it together and not um, cry <laughs> which I didn't do so that was good do I ever get nervous I like very rarely get nervous and and the way I sort of fend that off is I just really spend a lot of time preparing the John Kerry interview I prepared a long time I recently <laughs> interviewed the Ukrainian president me and a producer worked really hard on background and questions and she did a lot of made a lot of calls to make sure we were on the right page with the things we were asking so I mean I, I, I might get I don't know nervous is the right word I just feel like preparation helps you not feel so nervous so that you can just get in the zone and sort of do your thing I agree I mean I've come from a background where I've learned to public speak through the yeah. school years, yeah. and that kind of helps. Yeah. I, I find today's youth, not to like kind of get mean, but now when they're in school, they get the option of they, they can pass or get a zero, and I'm like, that's not going to help you long term. No. Well, of course, you just talked about your career, so let's get into the national part mm-hmm. of things. I, I like to believe that you will be the political host of it, of it all, like more or less the one that's going to really take the political control. The one thing I want to mention is... Do you, do you ever think when you're going to do the political side that you might get too into politics and then that the hosting part will like lose its, uh, I guess, nostalgia? Because I know with uh, hosts like Peter or Wendy, you just see them host, but now where you have the background of the political show, do you ever kind of think, how is that going to cross over? Well, I mean, certainly they want us all to play to our expertise, and we all have different areas of expertise, but they also want us to uh, sort of expand and, and grow obviously, as hosts and, and journalists. So that's very good. And I do have lots of interests outside of politics, so hopefully I'll be able to find places to, to feed into that and, and see that. I don't think I'll be pigeonholed. I don't, I don't think they want me to be. Peter also had a very big affinity for politics, um, which you know, made him drive sort of the show in that direction. I'll certainly continue to do that from my perspective. But because there's four of us, I do think it'll sort of 
we'll, we'll be able to balance out interests in a different way that maybe people didn't expect. And I also think because there's four of us and, you know, one of us could go off and do a story, that will allow me to go and if I want to leave Ottawa and not do a story here, I can go and do that, you know. And, and so maybe people will be surprised by some of the things that I do. You know, not that it's going to be a bunch of fluffy stuff, but maybe there'll be some stories that I will go and do and you'll be like, oh, I didn't know she knew anything about that. And and that's what makes it appealing. Um, I am going on the road next week to do a story in Thunder Bay about Indigenous kids. And like that's something I've been wanting to do for a really long time and haven't had time to do it because when you're doing a two-hour live show, it's way too demanding. So it, it'll allow me to go and put some public, so put some real people faces to things that are maybe being discussed in Ottawa, but in a different way. So. What can we expect from Rosemary Barton as the host of the National? Well, I think, I mean, I think you can expect what people have come to expect of me. You can expect me to care about politics a lot, to push those stories, to try and do accountability interviews, to try and get important people to talk to me. I think those are all things you should expect. But I think you should also be ready to see other parts of me. I do like to laugh a lot. <laughs> So I probably will do that. I love to read. So, you you know, I would love to do some, some interviews with authors. I like music. I like fashion. There's other things. I like food. Like, there's other parts of me. And if there's ways to treat news and get some access to those other parts of Rosemary, I think, um, I think that would be great for me. And I think it would be good for, for other Canadians because then it, it, it allows me to tap into other Canadians, not just this little bubble here in Ottawa. That kind of tied it right to the ex my next Good. question. Good. Oh, I'm doing very well. I didn't even know that <laughs> no, ahead of time. What, what aspects are you really looking forward to? And yeah. I mean, you you named a whole bunch of ones. Yeah. And I, I like that because, you know, it, it's I look at it from your standpoint of each one of you are really well at doing a certain task. Mm -hmm. And now that you've got the four national hosts, we get to see you in other spotlights. That's like right. I didn't even know Ian was like a very sports guy. Yeah, yeah. And like when I read that, I was just still like, okay, cool. I knew we covered yeah. the Vancouver like, yeah. Stanley Cup yeah. rides, but never knew that. No. Um, and now we know that you like to laugh. You like food things, like <laughs> something that maybe a lot of people don't get to no, see. No, that's right. And uh, yeah, and hopefully we'll hopefully we'll all be able to do a little bit of this <laughs> unexpected thing. Um, now, of course, we're both Carlton alumni. Mm -hmm. uh, you recently were at Carlton. You meant, or actually, you mentioned that Carlton to students to step outside their comfort zone. What do you think that means in your eyes for your comfort zone? Uh, well, I mean, it will be to step outside of politics to go places that maybe I didn't expect to go, to get my hands dirty maybe in, in different ways, to listen to, to people that I feel like maybe aren't always listened to or heard, to find those people and to, to let them know that those stories, their concerns matter in some way. Um, it's sort of read out those stories that maybe aren't getting attention. So a little bit that, and yeah, to, to go places where I might be scared to go. I like that response compared to when you, if you go to a school or university and then you tell people, like, we've seen it, our, our generation on Facebook always scroll through the videos and we'll see, like, a Jim Carrey or a Lisa Kudrow telling you, like, they got fired from Frasier yeah. and go <laughs> fail and, like, see what happens. And you're thinking, like, yeah, I will go fail. <laughs> but, like, but then when you, when, and then you look at it, you're like, yeah, but then they found their break. So, yeah. like, how hard is it for you to take them kind of seriously, like, you read the stories of how certainly even aspects of in this job, how Wendy or Peter got in their door, and you're looking at them like, that would never happen today. Oh, yeah, no, it wouldn't. Like, the way Peter they, got discovered, that would never happen. You yeah. could go be an announcer at an airport for the rest of your life. That's all yeah. you will do. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, that's why I look at it now, and I think it's not to, like, blame a school system or whatnot, but when you're 17, 18 going to school, you're just trying to figure out what do you want to do. Yeah. And then when an internship yeah. comes up, you're thinking, like, well, I'm too scared to go outside yeah. my bubble. Yeah. And then that comes back 10 years later, and you're yeah. thinking, like, should have stepped outside the bubble. Yeah, I mean, I when people ask me what's the, your best advice for journalists, my best advice is always go somewhere, go somewhere far away, go somewhere small, go somewhere where people don't care if you're making mistakes. You're not going to be the top reporter in Toronto or in Ottawa or Vancouver. So guess what? Go to Regina, go to Thunder Bay, go to Sudbury, go to places where you can have a good start, you can learn things, you can work your way up, because unfortunately that's how journalism works. You can make mistakes, have bad haircuts, wear bad clothes, nobody will know, nobody will care. And then, you know, the harder you work, uh, you, you will start to get breaks and you will start to move into bigger markets and figure things out. A, a lot of journalism, some of journalism is luck, being in the right place at the right time, most of it is hard work. 
I think someone showed you my questions beforehand. No, I That's didn't. Like someone, because that was the last thing I yeah. said was, literally, I'll read it. It's yeah. Lassie Rosie, congrats on all the success. <laughs> Great to see another <laughs> alumni doing well. If you had one message for the next yeah. wave of journalists, what would it be? It's that. That's what, and that's there you go. Yeah. There you go. It's and it's and and be curious. Ask ask yourself questions all the time. And you know, even I do this now. I'll say, you know, you really don't know enough about uh, the economy. You need to start reading those the business pages more. I'll do that for myself because, or you don't understand what's happening in Myanmar. Spend the next three days just reading articles about Myanmar. It is a job where, yes, it's super demanding. You're always under pressure. There's lots going on. But it is a job where learning, learning new things, is actually what you're supposed to be doing all the time. I don't know any other job like that where they want you to sit there and understand things. Um, and so that's, that's what you should try and foster, you know, and keep at that's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Rosemary Barton for coming on the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thanks for listening, and good night.